Benjamin Franklin was a man of many talents. He is known as a statesman, an author, an inventor. Franklin is the founder of mutual insurance in America. His golden link of mutuality is the central theme for a mural in the home office of the MFA Insurance Companies at Columbia, Missouri, a mural depicting the history of insurance. Provisions for the mural were made when architects designed the MFA insurance building. They left three recessed panels on one wall of the dining room to be decorated as company officials saw fit. One suggestion was photo murals of Missouri landscapes. Another was a painting to tell the story of insurance from earliest records to modern times. Sidney Larson was commissioned to start work on such a painting. Larson, who is on the art faculty of Christian College in Columbia, began his research by gathering materials from public and private libraries, from encyclopedias, from insurance companies themselves. As he read, ideas and images began to form in his mind, images based on events out of the past, vital to the development of insurance. He spent two months of intensive study before beginning his preliminary sketches. Now, with his ideas on paper, Larson is ready to submit them to company executives for approval. In the Christian College Art Workshop, Larson begins the next step. Using the small sketches as a guide, he holds a full-size paper cartoon of each panel. The big cartoon gives the artist an opportunity to check design and placement of elements before actually putting them on the canvas. Once the cartoons have been completed, Larson begins preparation of the imported Belgian linen upon which the finished mural will appear. Here he brushes on a test section of a plastic and gypsum solution called gesso. Later, several coats of gesso were applied with the canvas stretched in a frame. Marine bonded plywood attached to two before supports form the framework for each panel. Larson took special precautions to see that moisture will never harm the mural. Each piece of wood was waxed and sealed before being fastened in place with non-corrosive nails. The wall behind each panel was also waxed and sealed. In addition, the framework holds the painting two inches from the wall, allowing air to circulate behind it. After the panels were treated with a heavy paste of white lead, Venice turpentine and varnish, the canvas was unrolled against the paste and smoothed with the rubber roller. Larson transfers the cartoon drawings to the mural's three panels, which measure six feet high and 64 feet in overall length. Nearly all of the transfer is done freehand, since it allows greater freedom for final corrections made necessary by changes in viewing angles. Now that the charcoal outline has been finished, Larson is ready to apply color to the mural. He blends the pigment, oil with methacrylate, to get the hue of the sky on a sunny day, and the first color is ready to brighten the canvas. The first color on a canvas gives the same thrill to an artist as the kickoff does to a football player. Larson later admitted he was scared as the first brushfuls of paint went into place. With these first strokes, Larson begins the story of insurance, in which he depicts many characters, many events. Let's follow the story down the mural's three panels as he paints. As he adds sky background, the artist outlines the head of the Babylonian king Hammurabi, one of the most outstanding individuals in the early history of insurance. Like insurance today, the insurance of Hammurabi's time was based on need for protection. About 2,500 years B.C., rich merchants protected themselves by requiring their traveling salesmen to post everything they owned, their home and possessions, even their wives and children, 
as security for the expensive goods they carried. But often, roving bandits stole the wares, or they were lost through no fault of the salesman. Since he had posted his home, possessions, and family as security, the salesman was left penniless, while his loved ones were sold into slavery. Finally, the salesman revolted and brought into being an agreement which ensured that a salesman would keep his security if he was not at fault in the loss of the goods. Hammurabi recorded this first crude evidence of insurance in a series of laws known today as the Hammurabi Code. His code was first inscribed on clay tablets. But doubting the durability of baked clay, Hammurabi had his laws transferred by a sculptor to a diorite stone pillar. The stone, with its relief of Hammurabi, receiving commands from the sun god, is in existence today. But even before Hammurabi's time, another form of insurance was being practiced by the Chinese. Again, trade brought about the need for protection. As early as 5,000 BC, Chinese merchants used the Yangtze River as a highway to transport wares to other cities. There were times, however, when the boats never reached port, either lost in the river or pillaged and destroyed by Yangtze River pirates. Often the loss of one boatload of goods was enough to put a merchant out of business. Realizing how often they suffered the same sort of loss, the merchants began to combine their goods and boats before the start of each journey. If there were ten merchants and ten boats, each merchant would place a tenth of his cargo in each boat. In that way, if one boat was robbed or sunk, each merchant was out only one-tenth of his total, rather than one merchant losing his entire fortune. The one-tenth of cargo might be regarded as the first insurance premium. Insurance today works the same way as it did 5,000 years B.C. Each policyholder pays a small amount of premium, creating reserves out of which large losses are paid, maybe his own. Temple societies in Greece originated life insurance as a sideline for their religious activities. It was in reality death insurance, for each member paid monthly dues and in return was given a proper burial. At least one of the temple societies allowed members to borrow against the amount of dues paid, much the same as a policyholder can borrow against the cash value of his life insurance policy today. The Romans carried the idea of burial insurance even further and open burial societies for the general public. The burial society of the Roman army provided not only for burial rites, but included old age and disability benefits, and even paid soldiers travel expenses and bought new uniforms and equipment when they were promoted. Life insurance today has the same basic principles. It is insurance for the living. Once the people in the lands around the Mediterranean learned the principles of navigation, they began to use the sea as an avenue of trade. Ships of the Phoenicians and Greeks were familiar sites in ports of the known world. Later, they were replaced with biremes bearing the Roman eagle. And still later, the small but tall masted ships of the Renaissance period plied the ocean. Many of them met their untimely destinies instead of making their destinations. To offset the loss of a ship and its cargo, a practice called bottomry was begun. Originating among the Greeks, the idea spread to all the maritime countries. Merchants along the coast of Italy's Lombardy province were unusually active in making bottomry contracts. When a ship owner wanted to make a voyage, he would go to a merchant and borrow money for the trip placing his ship as collateral. If the ship made port, the loan was repaid with interest. If it did not, the ship owner kept the money. The merchant, in effect, had insured a safe voyage. More ships made port than did not, however, for the Lombardy merchants prospered and expanded their business as far away as England. The pages of history are filled with stories of fires fires that spelled nearly total destruction for many great cities. Conflagrations like the Chicago fire, the fire that followed the San Francisco earthquake, the great fires of London. The fire that turned out to be the most beneficial to mankind was the great fire of London in 1666. 
Starting from an oven in the King's Bakery, the fire devoured nearly the entire city. After surveying the destruction, a London dentist named Dr. Nicholas Barbin decided something should be done to put an end to the tremendous financial loss from such a fire. He began organizing the first fire insurance company and opened for business in 1667. Insuring homes and business property, Dr. Barbin's company was followed by other companies and fire insurance was on its way to becoming the dependable protection for many perils that we know today. One of the best known names in the field of insurance is Lloyd's of London. Lloyd's began in a waterfront coffee house operated by a man named Edward Lloyd. Seeing a way to increase his own profits, Lloyd began posting the latest shipping news and soon his coffee house became a gathering place where ship owners, merchants and insurers transacted their business. By 1696, Lloyd's was the largest center of marine insurance in the world, and the coffee house had moved from the waterfront into the heart of London's financial district. By 1800, the pattern of business was well established at Lloyd's. A caller, in a box high above the business floor, shouted news of the comings and goings of ships and other business, so the insurers no longer had to wander about the hall picking up what news they could on their own. It was about this time that the Lutein Bell became part of the business ritual of Lloyd's. The bell was the only thing salvaged from a ship named the Lutein. Insured through Lloyd's, the Lutein sank in 1799 with a five million dollar cargo. The Lutein Bell was used to signal the arrival of news, both good and bad, and still serves the same purpose today as it did then. Two rings means good news, one ring means disaster. The term underwriter also originated at Lloyd's. Notices were posted carrying a ship's name, destination, cargo, and value. An insurer would write his name under the information, giving the amount of risk he would be responsible for. Lloyd's still does business in basically the same way. Lloyd's is not an insurance company, but an association of individual underwriters who assume all or part of a risk. In most insurance companies today, an underwriter reviews applications for insurance and decides whether or not a policy will be issued. The artist shows Lloyd's as it looked about 1800. A sea captain has just arrived, and the underwriters wait anxiously to see whether the caller rings the routine bell once or twice. Although most people think of Lloyd's as an association that insures unusual risks, such as a surgeon's hands or a singer's voice, Lloyd's is the true father of modern marine insurance. Beginning with bottomry contracts in the 17th century, Lloyd's began to develop their insuring agreements a clause at a time, changing them slightly when necessary, and constantly improving them down through the years until now the Lloyd's marine policies are in effect law because the law has upheld them. Today, the Lloyd's policies form the background for all marine insurance, and the Lloyd's influence has spread to nearly every line of fire and casualty insurance. Lloyd's remains one of the great insurance institutions of the world. The finished first panel portrays the development of insurance from its first mention until the beginning of the Industrial Revolution a period of nearly 7,000 years. In colonial America, insurance was non-existent except for marine policies written on ships and cargoes. When fire destroyed a person's home and possessions, things that took a lifetime to accumulate, he was left to start all over again, literally from the ground up. It was Benjamin Franklin who saw a way to prevent such a catastrophe. In 1752, he placed a notice in his paper, the Pennsylvania Gazette, calling all interested persons together. And at this meeting was organized the first successful fire insurance company in America, a mutual insurance company. They called it the Philadelphia Contribution Ship for the Insurance of Houses from Loss by Fire. Each member of the company paid a certain amount of premium into a central fund. 
Then, if a member's property was destroyed by fire, he was saved from going back to the beginning to rebuild his estate. The contribution ship paid him the amount of his loss. The principles upon which Franklin's company was founded were good ones, for it is still in existence today, giving service to its policyholders. Near Franklin, the artist places the press, which printed the ideas that brought mutual insurance to America and helped make America a nation. The birthplace of mutual insurance in America was Philadelphia, which later became famous as the birthplace of our nation. In 1730, it was a city of 700 homes with no insurance and very little fire protection. Hoping to prevent a major fire, Franklin promoted one of the basic principles of fire insurance, loss prevention. In his Gazette, he urged his readers to be careful in handling fire. Even more important, he encouraged the formation of volunteer fire companies. In 1735, nearly 20 years before his insurance company was founded, he helped organize the Union Fire Company, Philadelphia's first firefighting organization. Others followed his example, and within a few years, the city had a half dozen such companies. Members furnished and maintained their own equipment. The crowning achievement of each fire company was the ownership of a hand-drawn, hand-pumped fire engine. Although they started as groups with more good intentions than firefighting knowledge, the fire companies soon made Philadelphia the safest city from fire in America. Early fire insurance companies identified the property they insured by placing a fire mark on the front of the building. Originating in England, the fire mark served to identify the property for each company fire department. There, the fire was left to be fought by the company whose mark the building bore. Uninsured property owners were simply left to fight their own fires. In Philadelphia, however, the volunteer fire companies pledged themselves to mutual aid regardless of personal interest. Franklin's contribution ship found, though, that after the fire companies had saved property bearing their hand-in-hand -hand fire mark, compliments and a financial contribution brought even quicker action the next time the mark was found on a burning building. At the left of the panel, artist Larson paints a group of distressed, aspiring people. They are people of all ages, all walks of life. Each has suffered some sort of loss, loss of property, loss of health through accident or sickness, loss of ability to earn a living through old age, loss of support of a loved one. Without the helping hand of insurance, none of them has been able to bear the loss alone. On the right, Larson depicts another group. These are a secure, happy people. They have no fear that a loss will leave them destitute, for they have provided themselves with the financial protection of insurance. In searching for a model with a happy face, artist Larson could find none happier than that of his oldest daughter, Kathy. Sitting still is difficult enough for professional adult models, but next to impossible for a nine-year-old amateur. The results, however, are worth the extra effort. Modeling fees for members of one's own household are considerably below the usual scale. High up on the wall is a likeness of Edmund Haley. He is best known as an astronomer and for the discovery of the comet which bears his name. Haley made his place in the history of insurance, however, as a mathematician who worked out the first actuarial tables, so valuable in the calculation of life insurance rates. Why is this mural called the Golden Link? Note the chain detail on Hammurabi's skirt, on the ship's anchor, on the framework of the lutein bell. Larson has symbolized each man's need for protection as an individual link of a chain, useless in itself. Distressed, aspiring people offer their links to Benjamin Franklin, who adds the Golden Link of Mutuality. Franklin defines mutuality this way, that every man might help another without any disservice to himself. 
Franklin's golden link unites the individual links into a strong chain of protection for all those who join in it. Through their chain of mutuality, these people are able to sound the great bell of freedom, of security, of faith, of joy. The second panel shows the development of insurance in America, development which began with Franklin's golden link. In the final panel, artist Larson uses a background of rolling Missouri countryside, her great rivers and bluffs. Other Missouri scenes show the columns and memorial tower of the University of Missouri and the University of Missouri Medical Center in Columbia. Also included is a city skyline, a composite made up of the skylines of metropolitan Kansas City and Jefferson City, the state capital. Nearby is a bridge, similar to the Missouri River Bridge at Jefferson City. Larson shows the rich farmland of Missouri, complete with a comfortable farm home, surrounded by grain crops and pastures stocked with fine cattle and sheep. Against this background, Larson shows the American people as a strong, healthy nation. They are able to go about their daily tasks free from worry because they know that their home, possessions, and responsibility to others are protected by casualty insurance. They know their children are assured an education and a normal life because they have provided for them through life insurance. Larson depicts the prosperity of the American people by including the traditional sheaf of golden grain. In America, older people enjoy retirement because of the financial security given them by using their life insurance as a retirement savings plan or through social security. Modeling for one of the junior characters in the panel is Larson's younger daughter, Nancy. Like her sister, Nancy finds modeling harder than it looks. After an hour of this, Nancy has begun to consider nursing as a career. Larson has also incorporated some of the indirect benefits of insurance into the scene. Insurance companies entrusted with their policyholders' premium have invested this money in industry, industry that provides employment and income for an ever-increasing standard of living. These investments help make possible America's vast transportation system, and when units of it are put to use, they are protected by the very companies responsible for their being. Through tax payments and other forms of support, insurance companies have contributed much to the growth of education and have aided civic progress. Who knows, perhaps through education, children playing today with golden strands of wheat will become the Franklins of their own time and produce the golden link that will bring mutuality to the entire world. Present day America, a happy people, vigorous and secure, living in a homeland overflowing with material and spiritual wealth, a people enjoying the protection and benefits of many forms of insurance. The moment every artist waits for, the final brush strokes, the signing of the finished work. After many months of painting, Larson surveys the finished mural. The three panels now show the history of insurance, events and characters out of the ancient past. It's beginning in America. America today, financially secure through insurance. On the farms and in the cities, people are able to enjoy a life made more full by Benjamin Franklin's golden link of mutuality, whereby every man might help another without any disservice to himself.